Basis has hundreds of features, but before we can proceed, there are a few key features we need to discuss. Everyone knows what a preset is. We're all familiar with products that allow you to store some setting for later recall. The recall of these presets allow you to get the device back to some known state. Your car stereo, your alarm clock, your favorite TV stations can all be stored as presets. Even our earlier products, the CM16A and the DSP modules, have presets for this same reason. However, as we designed the basis product line, it became apparent that one single term, such as preset, could not really describe what is going on with this product. We split the concept of preset into two terms. The first term is configuration, or config for short. Think of configuration as a wiring diagram. How many inputs and outputs you wish to use, the virtual wires which connect the inputs to the outputs, and where you've placed EQs, filters, delays, and so on onto that wiring. The basis can store eight completely different configs. These can be recalled at any time, essentially rewiring the box at will. When you recall a config, audio will mute for a few seconds as the box rewires itself. But this is to be expected. You'd mute the audio of an analog system any time you had to repatch it or rewire it to add or remove, say, an EQ or a crossover. The second term is snapshot. A snapshot is used to store the current values of parameters of various DSP and AMP functions. A snapshot can contain just one parameter or a few parameters or all of the parameters of a config. Snapshot memory is dynamically allocated as it's required. So unlike configs, which have defined blocks of memory, a snapshot might take more or less memory as needed. Because of this, each config can contain dozens, if not hundreds, of snapshots. There is a defined upper limit of 499 snapshots per config, but most systems to date have rarely needed more than a couple dozen or so. True loudspeaker protection architecture is a feature that we really won't explore in detail with this presentation. It's only being mentioned to make you aware of it. Because the basis knows all about the audio signal as it passes through the DSP, and it knows what the amp and loudspeaker load is doing to that audio at all times, the basis can optimize the audio power limiter function in real time. This maximizes the matchup of the amplifier to the load, while at the same time providing a much smoother, more transparent limiting function and protection of the loudspeaker. There is a built-in database of all QSC amplifiers and loudspeakers, both in the Venue Manager GUI and inside the basis itself. The basis already knows what amp model is being used. You merely use the GUI to choose what model and quantity of loudspeakers you are connecting to each amp channel. The Auto Power Limiters DSP algorithm does the rest. What's that? You're not using QSC loudspeakers? Not to worry. You can add the parameters for additional makes and models of non-QSC loudspeakers to the database. Since more and more audio systems are network-based, and more and more users are becoming computer and network savvy, it became apparent that we had to make the basis as secure as possible from accidental or malicious poking and probing into its settings and parameters. Anyone can download and install our software. The last thing you need at a club install is some bartender who is also a computer nerd hacking into the audio system and changing or erasing all of the settings just because he thinks the sound system needs more chest thumping bass, man. All basis devices require a network password to allow changes to the settings. The front panel can also be locked to prevent changes. By default, these passwords, along with the software venue manager's password, are all simply the letters QSC in lower case. We highly recommend you change the passwords for your projects because everybody knows what those passwords, default passwords are, but you must remember what your passwords are. If you forget the password, there is no secondary password, there's no factory reset or a backdoor password to allow you into the box. You must remember your password. 
In the event you ever forget your password, though, don't lose heart. We don't make it easy, but you can get an encrypted hash string, the encrypted form of the password, from the basis, which represents the lost or forgotten password. Call, email, or fax us that hash string, and we'll decode it and tell you your password. However, we might first have to do a bit of ID verification before we get out and give out that password. Finally, it's also possible that you might want to allow the end user to access certain parameters and functions of the DSP signal flow, but you might want to protect a few of the other things. So for example, you decide to allow a customer to access, say, the graphic EQs, but you don't want them changing the crossover settings for the loudspeakers. We've provided a means for you to password protect any part of the DSP signal chain by enclosing any or all of it within a special block called a DSP macro. Not only can you password protect the macro, but the macros can be stored as templates to be used over and over in various design projects. This screen shows the front panel of the basis. There are a lot of different buttons, LEDs, and other indicators. These include the power LED. There is no on-off switch for the device, so this blue LED lets you know that the basis is receiving AC power. The basis, like most other Ethernet network equipment, was designed to be left powered on 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. There is a red diagnostics LED. It is the only red LED on the product. It will, let up, it will light up to let you know that some attention is required, such as a corrupt firmware image or power supply tolerance issues and so on. Usually, the LCD display will also show you an error code, unless, of course, the LCD itself is the cause of the error. Network status LEDs. Three to six LEDs will let you know both the Q's control and CobraNet network connection status. The reason that there may be six LEDs is because there are two Ethernet connectors on the rear of the basis, one dedicated just for Q's control and one for CobraNet. More on this in a moment. Data port LEDs. For those basis products that connect directly to QSC amplifiers, you will be using special connections called data ports. These LEDs display whether there is an amplifier connected to each port, even if the amplifier is turned off. Signal present LEDs. Some basis models have universal inputs. These preamp models can accept audio from mic level up through line level. Non-universal or non-U models are line level only inputs. The U models, U for universal, show relative signal level by varying the intensity and color of these LEDs. Very low level signals will display them as black or green LEDs, getting progressively brighter as the signal increases, from black to dim green to bright green to yellow and finally to red. Yellow indicates a good signal to noise ratio while red indicates A to D clipping. The LCD panel, the entry keys, and the data wheel encoder can all be used to view various functions of the basis unit. Some functions and parameters such as configs and snapshots can be recalled or IP addresses can be viewed and even changed from these from these buttons and LCD. As mentioned on the previous slide, a security password may be used to lock these functions, allowing screens to be viewed but not allowing changes without the password. The rear of the basis is where all the connectivity takes place. There are audio connectors, data port connectors, and discrete I.O. connections, in addition to network connections. Data ports connect the basis to QSC amplifiers, which have the same data port connectors, through special QSC data port cables. This includes all models of CX, PowerLite, PowerLite 2, PowerLite 3, and DCA amps built to date. This represents the widest range of amplifier models, which can be computer controlled more than any other amp manufacturer in the industry. These connectors appear to be VGA connectors at first glance, and in fact they are similar 
to the HD15 VGA connectors. But that is where the similarity ends. Data ports carry audio, not video signals, to and from the basis and the amplifier. All of these signals are DC or audio frequency AC analog audio signals. There are no digital signals on these connectors or cables. There are two quasi-balanced audio signals to the amplifier. Returning signals from the amplifier being monitored include clips, temperatures, load status, output voltages, currents, and amp headroom. If the basis has analog inputs, and not all of them do, there will usually be Phoenix, also known as Euroblock connectors. One model has XLR connectors. These balanced connectors will present up to eight separate analog signals to the internal DSP for processing. The audio is then passed on to the outputs. There is no direct correlation between the analog inputs and the data ports. In other words, any input can be sent to any data port. There is also no requirement that the analog inputs must go to the data ports. The inputs could be sent to the Cobranet output and incoming Cobranet signals could be routed to the data ports completely bypassing the analog inputs or any combination of these. You can set up the different combinations and store them as different configs. Remember the basis can store up to eight different wiring diagrams as configs. Most basis devices have a monitor bus connector. This allows both inputs and outputs to be monitored as a separate analog audio feed to a monitor amp, powered speaker, headphones, or even view it on a spectrum analyzer, oscilloscope, or similar device. You can assign audio from any of the analog inputs, these would be pre-DSP signals, or tap into the data port outputs just between the basis and the amps, these would be post-DSP signals. Since the data ports also bring back the equivalent speaker terminal signals, you can essentially use the monitor bus to listen in on every amp channel connected to this basis from audio inputs ahead of the DSP to amp drive signals between the DSP and the amp to the speaker terminals themselves. This greatly simplifies system setup and troubleshooting. The remaining Euroblock connectors are discrete control I.O. Most basis devices have two relay outputs. These are ORM C, floating contact, normally open, normally closed, common connectors. These are not tied to chassis ground or to the power supply voltage, so you may connect, connect and control most any external equipment such as projectors, powered screens, lighting, air conditioning, basically anything that can be triggered with a simple contact closure. Note that these relay contacts are rated for 30 volts half amp switching current, so you won't be able to drive a chain motor directly. However, you could connect to an external heavy duty relay to these contacts to control such high powered equipment. There are logic level outputs available on most basis devices. These are four TTL compatible outputs, essentially zero volts off, five volt on type of signals. Use them like the relay outputs to control other external equipment that can use such signals. The various states of these logic outputs and also the relay outputs can be stored as part of the snapshots for future recall of those states. Most basis devices have omni ports as trigger inputs. Most of the time these are used as simple contact closure sensors. Omni ports can be driven by relay contacts, toggle switches, momentary switches, basically any trigger which can provide an open or a short trigger signal. The Omni port can then trigger some function within the basis, such as recalling a snapshot or global preset. More on global presets in a moment. Notice these are called Omni port, not trigger or contact closure inputs. That's because these can also receive other types of signals such as logic inputs. A logic input signal will be treated exactly like a contact closure. A logic low would be considered a short while a logic high would be treated as an open. These inputs can then be used 
as six individual triggers, or they could be combined as logic groups. A logic group of two omnis would yield four different combinations of states. Three omnis would yield eight states, and so on. Therefore, all six omnis combined into a logic group would yield 64 different combinations with the ability to recall 64 different config and snapshot combinations. The omnis can also receive variable resistance values. A simple 10k pot attached to a port will drive an 8-bit A to D converter from values of 0 to 255. These values can in turn drive any or all of the output levels of the basis, providing a very simple yet effective volume level pot on a wall or a lectern for one or more amp channels. The omnis can also use variable voltage ranges from 0 volts to 5 volts to perform the same function. So, the omnis can receive contact closure, logic signals, variable resistance, and or variable voltages. There is an RS-232 port on the rear of the units. This is not for external control from other third-party devices such as Crestron or AMX. This port is strictly for setup and diagnostics of the basis itself. We purposely limited the functionality of this port. If you wish to use other third-party controllers with basis, then you must use network-based IP controllers. We supply you with the control strings along with the installation files for the Venue Manager program. These XML strings are simple ASCII strings to recall presets, change parameters, and so on. There are six more LEDs at the rear of the device showing network status. These are identical to the front LEDs for the same purpose. We added them to the rear so that you wouldn't have to walk all the way around to the front of the racks just to see if you have network connectivity when you attach your Ethernet cables. Notice that on the rear, the LEDs are green and yellow which correspond to the Ethernet connection ports. The 10 base T port has a green ring around it and the 100 base T port has a yellow ring. The 10 base T port is a relatively low bandwidth control and data connection. There is no audio present on this connection at all, only control and function monitor signals and DSP settings. This port is called the Q's control port. The higher bandwidth 100 megabit connection is the CobraNet port, and it is primarily optimized to send and receive CobraNet audio. It turns out that this higher bandwidth capacity allows not only all of the input and output CobraNet bundles when fully populated, but there's even a bit of room to squeeze in the control signals as well. So you have the choice to run your system as a dual wire network with audio and control data separated from each other over different VLANs or hardware networks, or you can set up your system as a single wire network with all control and audio on the same network LAN. There isn't a one-way fits all connection strategy that works for all cases. You have to look at each project on a case-by-case -case basis and determine the best solution, either single wire or dual wire. The QsControl.net software help file will describe the advantages and ramifications of each network topology. Finally, there is a power cord connector. Well, of course there is. This device doesn't run on batteries. You have to plug it into a wall. But it has an internal universal supply which will automatically adjust for different AC voltages from 100 volts A3C through 230 volts AC at 50 hertz or 60 hertz. This means the same unit will work in USA, Europe, Asia, the Middle East, anywhere in the world as long as you use an IEC power cord with the correct connector to mate to the wall receptacle. Note too that this cable is detachable, as is all the cabling on the rear of the unit. This is important if you ever have to remove and replace a unit in a rack. You don't have to cut any cable ties or tear up your beautifully dressed wiring harness. Just unplug the cables, slide out the old unit, slide in the new unit, then plug everything back in and you're back up and running in no time.